Imaginary numbers. Are they really imaginary? A part of our brain's invention? Or are they a crucial part of our modern world? The earliest record of what we now call imaginary numbers can be traced back to the work of the Italian mathematician Gerolamo Cardano in the 16th century. In his book, Ars Magna, or The Great Art, published in 1545, Cardano discussed solutions to cubic equations. When solving certain cubic equations, Cardano encountered square roots of negative numbers, which he referred to as sophistic or reducible roots. These roots did not have a clear geometric interpretation at the time, and Cardano treated them as mathematical entities without a real-world counterpart. One type of cubic equation Cardano studied is of this form, where p and q are constants. To solve this equation, Cardano introduced a substitution to turn it into a depressed cubic equation. You can think of a depressed cubic equation as a transformed or simplified version of a general cubic equation. The purpose of this transformation is to make the cubic equation more amenable to solution and analysis. When you're depressing a cubic equation, you substitute x with this fraction for the purpose of simplifying the equation. The substitution would result in the following equation. Then, expand and simplify it. This will involve algebraic manipulation to get the depressed cubic form. The coefficients p and q in the depressed cubic equation will be expressions involving the original coefficients a, b, c, and d. In his solution, Cardano encountered expressions like the square root of negative 16, which was the beginning of imaginary numbers. Later in the 17th century, the concept of imaginary numbers was further developed and formalized. René Descartes made significant contributions to the development of algebra and the understanding of mathematical concepts, including his work on what we now call imaginary numbers. If you've been enjoying this video so far, please give it a like. In his work, La Geometrie, Descartes encountered solutions to cubic equations that involved square roots of negative numbers. These solutions did not have clear geometric interpretations in the real world. Descartes referred to these quantities as imaginary or imaginary roots to distinguish them from real numbers. Descartes acknowledged the existence of these imaginary quantities, suggesting an extension of the number system beyond real numbers. While he didn't fully embrace the concept of imaginary numbers, his willingness to work with and explore these solutions was an important step in the eventual acceptance of complex numbers. In Descartes' time, mathematicians might not have used the square root symbol explicitly, but they could have recognized that they don't have a real number solution. The understanding and acceptance of imaginary numbers continued to evolve with the contributions of later mathematicians like John Wallace, John Flamsteed, and John Pell in the 17th century. Ultimately, the groundwork laid by these mathematicians paved the way for the more systematic and accepted use of imaginary and complex numbers in the 18th century, with the work of Euler and Gauss. In his work, particularly in the 18th century, Euler made substantial contributions to various branches of mathematics, and his insights were crucial in bringing clarity to the understanding of imaginary and complex numbers. Euler's choice of I for the imaginary unit is often attributed to the first letter of the Latin word imaginarium, meaning imaginary. Euler's work on complex numbers and the exponential function played a crucial role in unifying the understanding of real and imaginary numbers. He showed that complex numbers could be expressed in the form A plus BI, where A and B are real numbers, and he established relationships between complex numbers and trigonometric functions. One of Euler's most famous formulas Euler's formula is given by the following. This formula relates complex exponential to trigonometric functions and is a powerful tool in working with complex numbers. The use of i as the imaginary unit has become standard notation in mathematics. The term imaginary in imaginary numbers is somewhat of a historical misnomer. Imaginary numbers, along with real numbers, are collectively part of the broader mathematical concept known as complex numbers. Complex numbers have both a real and an imaginary part. The term imaginary does not imply that the numbers are fictional or non-existent. Rather, it is a historical label that dates back to a time when mathematicians were grappling with the concept. Now, when we say a complex number has an imaginary part, it doesn't mean that this part isn't real or doesn't have real-world significance. It's simply a term to distinguish it from the real part. In applications, 
Both real and imaginary parts of complex numbers often have physical interpretations. Imaginary numbers are extensively used in electrical engineering, especially in the analysis of alternate current circuits. They are also fundamental in quantum mechanics. Wave functions in quantum mechanics are often represented by complex numbers, and the imaginary unit appears in equations that describe the behavior of particles at the quantum level along with other countless applications. If you like this video, I am sure you're gonna love this one. See you there.